Hi, and welcome to the stream. Today we're going to be playing NANDgame.com, which is a game where you build a computer out of nothing more than NAND gates. My goal here is to stream uh, for maybe, I don't know, half an hour or so. We'll, we'll power through as many of these puzzles as we can and see where that takes us. So I, I called this a game. I called it building a, com a computer. What is it? Well, it's based loosely on a course by Shockett and Nielsen called NAND to Tetris. And it's based in particular on the first part of that course. Uh, it's a fabulous course. It's on Coursera. I actually paid for it. It's the only Coursera thing I've actually ever bought. Um, the first part of the course and the book um, talks about building a hypothetical computer out of NAND gates. And with the course, they included this uh, made up HDL hardware description language where you design your parts. So here, for example, this is the definition of a half adder. And you, you write it in a language that's a little simpler to use than Verilog or VHDL, uh, but still gets the point across. So you have parts, they're wired up to different, uh, to, to different aspects of each other. And you start with just an AND gate. From the NAND gate, you build a NOT gate, you build an AND, an OR. And then you're off to the races. You build adders, you eventually build an ALU and a CPU. Um, the second half of the course is just as interesting and involves you um, writing an assembler, uh, a, a virtual machine, a VM translator, and eventually a compiler, and then writing programs to run in the virtual computer that you built. Um, so it's a fascinating course. Uh, I've seen a few takes on this course trying to gamify it. Um, probably too many to list, but the one that most people would probably have access to, other than NAND game, is this one called MHRD. Uh, I've turned off the sound because I didn't want to distract people from it, but it, it's very cute. It simulates uh, an old DOS computer. It goes through a little bootstrap sequence when you start it up. Uh, and for every task, there's an interface specification. And then for when you actually want to go, you want to design. So if we wanted to build a NOT gate, for example, we would define our parts. In this case, a NOT gate you can make with just a NAND. And then you wire everything up. So we're going to wire the input of the uh, NOT gate to the first input of the NAND gate. And then we're also going to wire it to the second input of the NAND gate. Let's see if I can do this without making too many typos. And then we're going to take our NAND gate's output and wire it to the output of the NOT gate. And then the game allows you to verify that you've done it correctly. So this is all well and good. What I found with both MHRD and uh, the NAND to Tetris course is that when you get to a certain level of complexity, writing your, um, writing your parts, designing your parts, using just text outstrips you. And so what I did when I played was I grabbed a, uh, a program called Logisim. Uh, it's a Java-based program that lets you draw circuits and simulate them. And I found that that visual way of designing circuits was much more helpful to me to let me design my ALU and eventually my CPU. And if there's interest, I, I'm sure I'm not gonna finish this today. I'm happy to show my CPU design um, maybe in the next stream. So NAND game is exactly this, only it's showing Logisim. It's, it's it's showing a, taking a Logisim like approach to um, this problem. So here we are. We're looking uh, at the first task. There's some help things that I'm going to go ahead and mostly get rid of. So again, our first task here is to build an inverter. You can see that there is um, a specification here, and we could do whatever we want as long as it takes these inputs and gives these outputs. So in this case, simplest possible chip we're going to build. If it takes zero, we want it to output one. If it takes one, we want it to output zero. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to drag our NAND or not AND gate onto our playground here. I'll go ahead and get rid of that help button. All right. Our bottom here is the input. We can toggle the input from 0 to 1. 
And of course, a NOT gate, you may be aware, is simply a NAND gate with both inputs wired to the same source. By having both inputs be the same, um, if, the, if that input is one, that will mean that we're going to invert that. So here you can see we have an input of zero and we have an output of one, that's correct. We can toggle that. And now we have an input of one and an output of zero. So I'm going to click the I've completed this level button. It will check it. And yay, we successfully did it. So let's go on to the next level. Now, now that we've designed our NOT gate, I wish I could rename this. I wouldn't call this an inverter. Can I? No, I can't. I can't rename it. That's sad. Uh, now we need to build an AND gate. So an AND gate is output when is one when both inputs are one. All right, so what do we need here for that? I believe we're going to take that. And I think we just need to invert a NAND gate. So the NAND gate will be zero when both inputs are high and one otherwise. So I think that the inverse of that, oh, I grabbed the wrong thing. We're going to wire the output of the NAND gate to the input of the inverter and wire that all up. Let's make them both one. And it's not working because I didn't actually wire it up. Try it again. There we go. Great. So now we've solved two things. Uh, I actually do have solutions for all of these, you know, done essentially in NAND to Tetris. Uh, I probably will refer to those solutions at some point um, just to keep the stream moving briskly. I think uh, I think it'll be pretty boring if I have to sit here and remember how to do all of these things from first principles. So let's go ahead. What's our next? An OR gate. So an OR gate is one when at least one input is one. Um, when you're doing this type of design, one of the things you often worry about is optimizing. And um, both MHR MHRD and the NAND to Tetris tool sets will tell you how many low-level NAND gates you used to do any particular design. And people can get really tripped up in themselves uh, trying to make sure they use the minimum number of components. I don't remember if NAND game has that type of mechanic. I certainly haven't seen it. So if I'm correct, if we look at this pattern here, um, this is very similar to the NAND pattern, 0, 1, 1, 1. Let me go back to the NAND level here. Oh, I don't get the NAND level. It doesn't show us because it's a given. Uh, but a NAND gates pattern would be 1, 1, 1, 0, I think. So I think if we invert the inputs to the NAND gate, that will actually accomplish what we want. Let's see if this is correct or not. Uh, or gate. So the output zero when both are zero. It's one when one of them is on. It's one when the other is on. And it's one when good. That's great. Oh, it is. It so it turns out it does actually tell us whether we've uh, made the optimal design or not. Uh, I don't tend to get too hung up on NAND count. I, I find that for me, I want to understand the thing I'm building, and I'd much rather understand it than have an optimal design, at least when starting. All right, so next we're going to look at an XOR gate, or exclusive OR. So I think, I think, well, obviously we're going to start with an OR here, right? And that's part of our XOR design. And then, so that's half of it. So that needs to be true for this to be true. And then we don't want them both to be on. So that's not and in that case. So we want both of these things to be true. I'm not even going to test it. Did that work? Yes. Uh, and so here we're, it's giving us one of these optimization warnings. This uses the fewest possible components, 
but it is possible to solve with a lower number of NAND gates. So yeah, if we, instead of using our ANDs and ORs, if we used just bare NAND gates and wired them together correctly, we would use fewer NANDs. And like I said, I don't care about that. And I'm not even going to try even a little bit. Okay, next we got the first, what I think of as the first real component, uh, which is the half adder. Let's see. So this is interesting because in NAND to Tetris, um, before you go on to the half adder, um, what they do is they have you design some parallel circuits. So you have an OR that can handle 8 bits or 16 bits, or I think it's 8 bits. Um, no, actually, I think they do 32-bit components. I'd have to look. Um, an AND that does the same thing and all of that. Um, so we're going to do a half adder. A half adder I actually know because I used to run an experiment with school kids where I would have them line up as if they were adders, uh, as if they were half adders to calculate a value. I believe that's correct. And then one of these is the sum and one is the carry. Um, great. I'm, I'm totally unclear on whether H or L. There it says the H output is the high bit, L is the low bit. So the low bit is our sum, and the high bit is our carry. I don't like the terminology NAND game uses, frankly, but let's see if it likes that. Yes, fewest possible components, I'll take that. I am streaming this. It is super early in the morning, and I don't really expect anyone to um, be awake and paying attention. But uh, I will send this, uh, I, I will publish this on YouTube, and that's where I expect most of you are, are going to end up seeing this. Okay, so now we're going to make a full adder. So there are two ways to make a full adder. You can, you can do it with gates which is, I think, the more electrical engineering e way to do it. But I, I'm going to just do it using two half adders and an OR because I feel like that's uh, simpler. And like I said, easier to understand. So if I recall correctly, first half adder, we're just adding A and B. And then let's see. That actually is our carry, and then that ripples over to the second adder, which then adds in the third bit, and I think I'm wrong here. I've already wrong. It actually goes into this. This is the carry, and then this is the carry, and this goes... Oh, I thought it would disconnect it when I did that. I have totally confused myself here. High bit or low bit? All right, I'm going to get out my previous design because I've totally managed to confuse myself here. So... This gets from the, damn it, I keep uh, breaking things. I think that gets from the sum. That gets from there. That gets from there. That gets from there. No, I can already tell this is wrong. Well, let's see how wrong it is. Do I at least have everything wired up? Yeah, and it's going to tell me this is wrong. Ooh, that's very wrong. All right, let's try this again. Let's break everything. I know the components are right. I think I confused myself about which of these is the sum and which is the carry again, because they're not using those terminologies. So. The 
high bit, H is the high bit, so H is the carry. So our OR is going to be wired up, first of all, to both carries from these adders. That is correct. I'm positive. And then that carry is wired up to the output of the OR. Let's move that over there so we don't get confused. A and B both go there. Right, and then we ripple this into the input of that, and then we add that, and then our sum, not low bit, goes there. All right, so let's see what we got here. One, that's correct. One O, that's correct. All three of these should be one one. That looks right to me. Okay, much better. Whew, I confused myself there. Marvel as I fail to design a full adder. So now we're going to build a multi-bit adder. Build an adder which adds two bit numbers, two two-bit numbers, and one bit carry. All right. And here they're calling it carry and some great things. That's that's really helpful, dudes. Uh Let's see. So we're going to need, obviously, multiple adders here. All right, let's do it. Where's our... I mean, isn't this just the generalization? Oh, I see. It transformed our half adder into a full adder. So we no longer have access to the half adder component, although, of course, we could rebuild it again if we really wanted to. Okay, so we're probably going to need multiple adders. Hmm, let's think about this. So A1, A0 is a 2-bit number. All right, so since these are 2-bit numbers, let's do these this way. We're going to do... Uh, this is like backwards from also how I want to think of the number. I want the, they're doing it right to left, which makes perfect sense numerically uh, in binary. But when designing these, I still tend to think left to right. And so I want my zero most to be on the, the left. All right, and so our B inputs will go there. All right. So this is our this one here that I'm moving is our zero. So that's our low bit. And then this is our high bit. And then we have our carry. So our carry is going to go into our low. All right. Our sum for the zero bit goes there. And then that's going to ripple over to there. And then our sum for the second bit will come from here. And then our carry will come from there. I believe that is correct. One, binary two, binary... Th no, I think that's wrong already. That's right. No, I've screwed up somehow. That likes it, but that doesn't make sense to me. I, I'm confused about how the carries are being treated here. But, hey, I, I guess I'll take it. I, I must have done it correctly. This is the simplest possible solution. Component design for it can be repeated to add arbitrarily large numbers. Okay, so they inverted the NAND to Tetris way of doing things. They're going to be... Um, you could extend it out to 16. So they're going to do that for us. And indeed, here is our add 16. All right, so now we're going to do an increment um, operator, operator, something that just adds 1 to a 16-bit value. So obviously, we're going to start with add 16. That's our input. Uh, they're giving us a zero. How nice. If we invert that zero, we're going to get one, which will be that. And we can just wire the carry, I think, 
up to zero since we will never have a carry input. It's a little confusing, isn't it? Uh, and then we're going to throw away the carry, I think. It says ignore the carry result if the result is larger than 16 bits. So we leave that unwired, and that's it. Great. Simplest possible solution. Wonderful. Subtraction. Outputs A minus B as a 16-bit number. If the result is less than zero, it's represented as 65536 plus the result. Um, in order to build this, I think you actually need to understand a little bit about two's complement notation, which I'm not going to get into. Um, I feel like, you know, it's definitely one of those, go to Wikipedia and, and search for this in order to understand it. Uh, so I think uh, it's very suspicious that invert 16 just showed up here magically without me having to make it. So I'm taking that as a hint that uh, we're going to be doing that. I'm just assuming that what this actually is going to be, and I'm not even really thinking this through, so... If it's wrong, you know, that's fine. I'll be embarrassed. And I'm going to assume that we're ignoring carries for right now. Let's see what we get. Nope, not right. Zero minus zero. Okay, yeah. I guess I actually have to think about this. If the result is less than zero, it is represented as 65536 plus the result. A minus B. Well, clearly that didn't work. Can I actually take things off of the... Is there no way to... Oh, I see you have to drag them down here to the little... There we go. User interface, what's it good for? Okay, well, obviously, if we just add A plus B... Our zero plus zero case will be correct, and every other case should be false. Well, the zero plus zero. Why would, oh, one minus zero, of course. Uh, and one minus one ends up as two. That is wrong in the way we would expect this to be wrong. So let's look at these patterns here, uh, sadly. The web browser is cutting it off a little bit. Let's see, so if it were, if the result is less than zero, so if this were zero, let's, we can do this, can't we? This is going to be zero, and this is going to be one. In that case, we would want the result to be all ones. Oh, I vaguely remember this. I want to say that it's something along the lines of invert everything and then add one. Yeah, I think that's, that's the two's complement trick is you invert everything and add one. Let's see if that did it. Yeah. Uh, I'm very dissatisfied with this um, as like the way I reach this solution. And this is an example, by the way, in the difference between taking a course and playing it as a puzzle game. In a course, you would have had a class where they spent, you know, 45 minutes talking about two's complement notation, which is not at all, I think, an intuitive concept and helping you think your way through it. So, but this I think concludes the mathematical, uh, the addition, subtraction, etc., portion of the class of the puzzles. So now we move on to some uh, flags. Now build a component that indicates if a number is zero. We implement this for a four-bit number first. Okay, well we've got a four-bit number. Uh, so it's a one-bit output. So that's good, and this output is going to be true 
if all of these are true. No, if all of these are false, excuse me, exactly the opposite. So isn't that literally a four bit NAND? Am I thinking about that wrong? It feels like it's too simple, but I'm gonna try it. I'm sure I'm thinking about this wrong. Um, I also, again, don't like this. Why is it not? Um, right, it's not a four bit. It would be a four bit NAND, but I don't actually have a four bit NAND here. I could make two NANDs, right? No, because NAND is just telling me that they're not both one. It's not telling me that they're not, that they are all zero. So I think we actually would want a four bit AND here and then invert the result. Right, and then those go like that. No, because again, if any of them are, boy, I really need to have coffee before I start doing this. Let's try this again. Make it a four bit or, and then I think this should be an or also, right? And now if any one of these is one, then that will be one. And then we can invert it. I think that is our zero detector. This feels like it uses too many NANDs. It is correct. Yeah, it's optimal. All right. Uh, there's actually a, an interesting, looking at this map here of um, inputs and outputs, um, if you are an actual electrical engineer as opposed to a dilettante like me, one thing you can do is build something called a Carnot map that kind of divides the inputs and outputs into regions and that will tell you basically from the map what's the theoretically optimal number of uh, gates one needs to implement it, which doesn't actually, you know, can help you actually design it. Less than zero. Outputs one if the input as a 16-bit number is negative. A number is considered less than zero if bit 15 is one. Bits are numbered from right to left, so they very nicely give us the splitter. I think this exercise is really just about learning how to use the splitter. And then we're going to wire this up to bit 15. Great. How are we doing for time? How long have I been streaming here? Because I don't want to make this too long. Looks like about half an hour. I'll go a little longer. Let's go till maybe we get, what are the levels here? All right, maybe we will go through the selector and switch, and then that is a natural place to take a break. In fact, that's where the class uh, ends the second week, I think. And then the next time I do this, maybe next week, I can cover the memory section. And then uh, if we, if there's interest, if we keep feel like if I feel like continuing to do this, we can go on and do the computer parts of things. All right, optional levels. Ooh, I didn't even realize there are optional levels. Well, I'll have to go back and do this. All right, so this is, I think, our second from last level, a selector. Again, I don't like the terminology they've chosen to use. This is not a selector, this is a MUX, or a multiplexer. A select component selects one out of two bits, two input bits for output. The S bit indicates which input is selected. If zero, this is selected. If one, this is selected. Let's take a look. Uh, what do we start here? I think 
Right, so we've got this selector bit. That's the key. And the selector bit is going to tell us which of these D0 or D1 is used. So the way to think about these things, it's very easy as a, if you're a programmer to think about circuits as having a flow of control, but that's not actually true. When you're designing a, 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 a a circuit without the concept of time, the entire circuit is essentially evaluated at once. So what you can do is build paths, build every, you have to build every path through the circuit, and then only one of them will actually be connected at any given time. So we know that if the selector is high, then we're gonna use D1. So what does that sound like? That sounds like AND. and if the selector is not high, then we want to do D0. It's kind of the default. So what we can do here is invert that selector. So now we have a, a value that means not selected, All right? And only one of these will be true at any given time. So I think we can just use an OR gate, which is literally almost just plumbing here. Um, you could probably do this in, in a more clever way, but let's see if that's correct. Fewest possible components, great. All right. Well, that was actually, uh, it, it's fascinating to me what I'd love to do, and I don't have my Logisim designs on this computer, so uh, I can't show them right now. But if you're designing these things schematically, I, they're much more organized than what I'm kind of throwing together. This, this, the UI here actually influences what my schematics are looking like, and I don't like it. Um, so I'd love to show a sample of that, and I will make a note that I'll get those Logison diagrams on this computer for the next stream um, so that you can kind of see how you would do this in a more organized fashion. Okay, once again... This is the last time today I will complain about their terminology. A switch component channels a data bit through one of two output channels. So I don't call this a switch. I call it a DMUX. Um, and it's going to look somewhat similar to our previous uh, part. Just the wiring is a little different. So again, we have a selector and we have actual data. But here we only have one data component down here, and we have two possible outputs, and we're basically selecting which output to go to. So both of our AND gates are hooked up to the same data, um, data source. One of them is hooked up to selected, Again, we're going to make it, oh my God, I hate this. Let me give myself more room. We're going to have a not select here. See, wherever you put it, it's, un, it's inappropriate. Um, and then so not select hooks up to that one and selected hooks up to this one. And again, only one of these will be true at any one time. Let's make sure that's true. Okay, so with our data source set to one, we can see that the flow control is going and C0 is set high and C1 is low. But if we flip this, that flips over and now C1 is high and C0 is low. And so that's our DMUX sorted, I believe. There we go. All right, and now we're going to get into uh, latches and flip-flops and RAM, which is a fascinating uh, fascinating technology and takes a little while to wrap your head around because you start introducing the concept of feedback into your circuits. So that's just a step away from, you know, essentially having stateful time-based circuits. But I feel like this was a good introduction to NAND game. I feel like we've powered through an entire section in just under just over half an hour. And I think I'm gonna call it here this morning. 
and see how this video looks to me afterwards. And then maybe next week we'll pick it up and we'll start implementing some RAM. So thank you very much for watching, whether it's on Twitch or YouTube. And I'll see you next time.